some uh, Protestants, many of most Protestants that aren't Wesleyan, well, because Adventists are particularly known for their Wesleyan ishness <laughs> regarding obeying God's commandments and all that. Lotus is, and I often bring this up to people who, who will sort of dismiss my tradition for being more biblical than others, I guess. And I'll just say on it, I'll just ask them on it, so I'll take them here and I'll go, what do you do with this? You, you who base your beliefs on scripture and um, stand on scripture and the whole counsel of God. It says here, blessed are they that, in the, this is a context of Jesus' judgment coming to return to the earth to, to execute judgment on he who is holy and he who is unholy and to give to every man according to their work. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life, which is the source of God's provision for us to live forever, and may enter in through the gates of the city. And just like throughout Jesus' ministry and the teachings of the apostles in many places, in many contexts regarding salvific sort of context, for without are dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. But sinners. Now, people come up with clever ways um, to get around this. You know, you can go to Corinthians and where Paul says, you know, do not know that these sorts of people will not inherit the kingdom of God. Right? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. I never knew you workers of lawlessness. Uh, we're condemned for our sin, but Jesus died for our sins so that the righteousness of the law could be made manifest in us by the Spirit of God, which writes His law in your heart, which is the new covenant, which is the way of salvation to the nations. Um, so, what do you do with this verse? Well, one, one method, and I want to explain this, would be some Calvinists will do this, and I don't, so this is how I try to operate, but I also don't want to, I can also, you could also be accused of being dishonest in not pointing out where you differ from them, but sometimes people don't understand the differences. Okay, I, I'm thinking of my Calvinist friends, and they'll, they'll say, oh, there's this thing, this idea of, of a text being descriptive, and other texts being particularly prescriptive. Now, what, what might, I think originally those categories weren't like invented to get out of what a text is saying. Like people will use those categories, kind of like the free gracers do. They'll insert the fact that a category exists and then bring it into the context because it has to be not, it has to mean something other than it seems to read. There's these categories you can bring in even though there's no real system of, of demonstrating why you should or shouldn't bring it in according to the text, but because they have to to make the text say something other than it seems to say, they bring in these categories that are really talking about something else in regards to particulars and specific things regarding sort of the, the tense of a verb or the sort of setting. Is it a teaching? Is it just a description by the narrator and who's who's written the, the writer of the text? But it may it may have application in certain contexts. Is it true that this is descriptive of what the people who go into the kingdom of God look like in some sort of honest sense? Right? You, there's different ways to look at it. Well, they generally don't practice these things, or they generally have a bend towards obey obedience maybe i'm okay with that it's but it, let's not make it say something it doesn't say this is true in a positive sense if we believe scripture it's not but it's not saying prescriptively do this to be saved right because we believe in justification by faith so you don't do these things to become the children of god and enter into the city um well, I think it's that it's saying that people who do these things are worthy of not entering the city, but okay. Okay, I do believe in justification by faith, but I still have to face these texts honestly. It is descriptive, certainly. 
This is a description of what the people who enter the eternal estate and those who don't, it's a description of what that's going to look like. So a Calvinist likes that distinction because they especially want to emphasize, you know, total depravity. You can't, you can't decide to obey God, even though at other times they'll admit that God changes your will. So to me, it's a really silly semantical game. Like, I'll, I'll give it to you. It's descriptive. And there's a sense where it's not prescriptive. Everything's descriptive in that sense. The question is, is it prescriptive or not? Well, if it's descriptive of what the saints will do, they have to have the will to do it, and God changes their will to do it. So it's still true that it's the thing that I could, you could ask the question. If To be a saint, do you have to do God's commandments? The answer is yes, because otherwise it wouldn't be a description of the saints in what they do. Okay, or I could ask you, if you're a Calvinist, you say this is descriptive, I go, is it describing you? Yes or no? Is this a description of you? Is this describing you? And if not, are you, are you elect then? Okay, it's not prescriptive because you can't, you can't choose to obey God even though he says constantly he's long-suffering and he's merciful and he says you can. Read Deuteronomy 30. He tells them, don't make excuses. You can do it. I want you to. You have two options. Choose the right one. You're going to tell me you can't do it. You're going to make excuses like, who will go over the sea? Who will do it for me? And he's like, don't say those excuses because they're not true. You can do it. And I want you to please do it. So God indicates that it's his decree, his righteous decree that they do choose life. He indicates that uh, I know you're going to make excuses and say things like you can't do it because it's impossible. And he goes, you're going to make those excuses. And, I'm and it's like God's talking to you, total depravity people out there. This is like a literal narrative where God says, hey, I know you people are going to say Stuff like, it's impossible and I can't. You can't keep the commandments, you moron. Or, I'm totally depraved. Until I until uh, I acknowledge that I'm totally depraved and then I'm suddenly the elect. Because I believe that, even though the text never says anywhere, descriptively or prescriptively, that a believer must come to the conclusion of total depravity or Calvinistic distinctives. Where is the prescriptive or descriptive uh, uh, place in the Bible where that is said in either sense why do you want to make me believe I can obey God when I have a story where God's people were warned not to say that God like it's basically prophecy and then you insist on demanding that I believe that about the text when there's narrative that says exactly the opposite and it gives you a description of how God's people are in denial, and it's like, but if I bring up the fact that the Bible describes what the problem is throughout the whole text, people don't obey, God says don't pretend like you can or that it's impossible, you can, you're my people, I'm telling you you can, and now we're in the New Testament, we have the Holy Spirit, we can't obey, uh, but, but as long as we admit that, that's what we'll preach the gospel as. Denying that you can do it, and that's what makes you elect. Agreeing with the idea that you're trash, it's impossible to obey. I know God said otherwise, but he was just joshing them, man. He was just being facetious. When Jesus says, keep the commandments uh, if you want to enter life, he was being facetious. When he says your righteousness is supposed to be greater than the Pharisees, who he describes throughout the narrative is not actually obeying God. And people tell me, oh, the Pharisees are really righteous. Wait a minute. How is that? Which righteousness are you talking about? The fake kind that God was teasing when he gave commandments and called them righteousness in his word? And then Jesus is our righteousness and the righteousness of God. And he kept the commandments perfectly. And John says, let no man deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he, Jesus, is righteous. 
the law is the standard. Jesus is the righteousness because he obeys them perfectly. That is the things which define right doing, which is God's word, God's commandments, God's law. Oh, no, 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 no. Um, righteousness is just right doing. It's not, it's not that it isn't right doing. It's that it's also because of the good God who demonstrated who he is in his character by Jesus, who never broke the laws because they define the righteousness, which defines the character of God. You can't get around it. It's both and, and it's our duty and the purpose of the new covenant. Is this descriptive or prescriptive? Well, if it's not describing you, <laughs> then you're basically saying you're screwed. And if you can't obey, which is what the standard is, and then you're going to what is it? Oh, let me ask you. Okay. If it's just descriptive and not prescriptive. Let me ask you if it's not describing you, what is the problem? You're not following the things that you're supposed to do. That is the prescription of obedience. So you don't become that which is being described when you don't do those things by teaching that you can't do those things and that you don't do those things. But as long as I like, where does the text explicitly say that's what we're supposed to believe that proves we're the elect? No. Say it's not prescriptive. Okay, fine. I guess it is descriptive. But is it not the thing you're supposed to do? That is a prescribed thing. This is what saints do. So you're not a saint if you don't do it. If you would, if you would like to follow God and you like Jesus, you love Jesus, he says, keep my commandments. That is a prescription. If, if you love Jesus and this isn't describing you, it is a prescription to you. It's just like people will say Adventists are so dumb. They're always like, they think the law means the Ten Commandments. It doesn't mean the Ten Commandments. It means the whole law. Fine. You know what the whole law includes? The Ten Commandments. <laughs> That's the thing. Ad, some Adventists don't know the theology really well. But it's like we're saying it's, it's <laughs> that you're saying it's not the Ten Commandments. Okay, fine. It's the whole law in some sense. We don't necessarily disagree with that. After all, we think we're supposed to keep the food laws. We think the principles of the entire law apply. We don't think you have to do animal sacrifices anymore. Those are distinctions. By the way, 1 Corinthians seven nineteen again, there's a distinction made. Why? Because the whole law included circumcision. And he says circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Is circumcision a commandment in the whole law? Yes. So when he says circumcision specifically doesn't really matter, but keeping the commandments is what matters, is he contradicting himself? I say no. If that's true, that's a distinction in the law, in the New Testament text. The fact that there's the whole law has 613 commandments, if you count them all up, the whole law, but the Ten Commandments are the Ten Commandments written by God, not by Moses, even though all of that is included as the law of God under the Mosaic Covenant. The fact that the Ten that God specifically wrote twice himself is a distinction. The fact that there's 613 commandments in the whole law, but there's this thing called the covenant, which is the 10 words, the fact that it's 10 words among 613 commandments is a distinction in the law. It's really not that difficult. The problem is you have Sabbath derangement syndrome. Is what you're really saying is, I'm going to say dumb stuff because I just don't want to follow the Sabbath. And that sounds like a you problem. <laughs> 